to the cloud. And Hello and welcome to I Didn't Have to Worry. Um, I'm really excited to have you all here. Uh, this is a press conference hosted by the Cairo Center and Children's Health Watch and Revolutionary he Healing on the importance of the child tax credit and the way that families used it to make ends meet uh, when, when it was available. I wanted to offer some brief instructions before we get started. Um, one of the uh, elements of this is that there will be a press release that goes out after this press conference, including the full link to the report, along with key findings and some quotes from some of the speakers. Uh, there's gonna be two sections of today's conference and then we'll take questions. The first portion is going to be on the research and methodology of the report from researchers, Dr. Diana Burnett, CEO of Revolutionary Revolutionary Healing, and Dr. Stephanie Edinger, uh, Executive Director of Children's Health Watch. The second will be on policy implications and moving forward, where you will hear from Shali Gupta Barnes, Policy Director of the Cairo Center, and Allison Bovell Ammon, Director of Policy for Children's Health Watch. Then we'll take questions from the chat or audibly. Um, no matter what method you use, it's much easier if you say your name and outlet first. And if the question is directed at a particular person, uh, just go ahead and say that when you ask it, that's helpful. One last note, to keep the conversation going uh, on Facebook and YouTube this evening, there will be a round table discussion at 6 p.m. Eastern titled Lessons from the Pandemic, the Impact of the Child Tax Credit, where we will hear from researchers, advocates, and impacted people. Without any further ado, let's get started with Dr. Diana Burnett and Dr. Stephanie Edinger. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen and share a few slides that we put together. Okay, so the uh, really great to be here this morning. Uh, our report is I Didn't Have to Worry How the Child Tax Credit Helps Families Catch Up on Rent and Improved Health. And I want to acknowledge all of our fantastic uh, co authors on the report um, and the families who participated. Um, a little bit about the study itself. This was a mixed method study highlighting experiences of families with young children during the COVID-19 pandemic, the impact of the advanced child tax credit monthly payments on health and material hardships and barriers to accessing advanced child tax credit payments. Um, we recruited families in four US cities, Boston, Philadelphia, Minneapolis, and Little Rock, which are the Children's Health Watch research sites. And we had several different data sources, including longitudinal surveys with um, families that we spoke to pre-pandemic and then uh, followed up with by phone um, during the pandemic. Uh, and then also we invited those families to join us in the qualitative part of the study to do focus groups, in-depth interviews, or both of those. So on the quantitative side, the longitudinal survey side, we found that the advanced uh, child tax credit helped families catch up on rent and improve parents' health. We found uh, that uh, for the families that we interviewed in fall 20, between fall 2020 and spring 2021, who were behind on rent, then received the child tax credit, they were more likely to have caught up on their rent payments when we interviewed them again between fall 2021 and spring 2022. Specifically, they were 2.66 times more likely to catch up on rent after falling behind earlier in the pandemic. There was also other good news about the child tax credit. Uh, families were 1.3 times more likely to have a parent in excellent or good health if they received the child tax credit compared to those who did not receive the child tax credit. And in addition, our data also suggested that advanced child tax credit payments helped in other ways, supported family food security, it helped cover childcare costs, and also decreased the risks of um, parents experiencing anxiety and depressive symptoms. But it wasn't all happy news. Uh, we also found really um, concerning uh, inequities. We found that 
particularly among our immigrant families, they were 42% less likely to receive those advanced child tax credit payments compared to our US born families. And there were also a host of other inequities in the receipt of those payments. There were differences by race, ethnicity, nativity, banking status, education level, household employment, marital status, and tax filing status. And in fact, many of our families faced multiple barriers to accessing these critical tax and other resource uh, supports that really are so important for supporting family health and well being. Uh, now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Burnett to tell you about the qualitative side of our study. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, yes, um, as, as Stephanie was saying, um, the child tax credit, right, had, had the both sides, right, of, of both support and some challenges. So first I'll talk about how the, the child tax credit really helped parents, right? So I'll be reading through um, some of the, the quotes from some of the parents to give you a sense of, of to support the data that, um, that Stephanie just talked about. So receiving the CTC um, helped one of these parents in a lot of ways as far as being able to provide um, for their children, right? And they didn't have to worry right, about running out of certain things like food. So the CTC was able to fill in, to fill in gaps and help people make, um, meet their sort of basic needs and to offer them some of the security that they didn't have in its absence. Also, um, they felt like the, the CTC made it a little bit easier right, when they were receiving it because they could look forward to it each month. It was a regular source of, of income, of supplement, um, and they were able to do a variety of things with it, right? Um, like, for example, buying things for their children, um, paying bills. Um, so it was, it was difficult for some parents when it was able to stop. So the CTC overall really helped parents, both in terms of allowing them to meet some basic security, having some, um, some security in the, the availability of the payment, and being able to meet their needs of their children and their overall household needs. Uh, next slide, please. So throughout um, the interviews and the conversation and focus groups with different parents, what we found out from um, the conversations about the impact of the pandemic, as well as, as the child tax credit, is that the parents were, were facing challenges affording food, rent, and child care, right? We know that the impact of inflation has been the most drastic um, that people have seen in a long time. And so the increases of all of those and the difficulties of being able to, to find, find food oftentimes, secure housing as well as childcare throughout the pandemic was difficult. But these advanced child tax credit pay, um, payments helped to offset some of that financial strain and really help parents um, when they needed to provide um, for themselves as well as the entire household. Um, also, right, as we know, the pandemic created a number of closures and economic hardships, right? And this took a toll both mentally um, and physically. Um, parents talked about the impact of depression, anxiety, isolation, um, agoraphobia, all different kinds of ranges of effects on their health, right? In addition to their, their, their physical and mental health both being impacted overlapping. Right, that they were experiencing things in their body. They were experiencing weight gain. They were experiencing pains. They were experiencing unexplained um, physical effects of this, right? But we also know, right, that these sort of um, the pandemic closures and economic hardships sort of already exacerbated what was already there in terms of insecurity and instability. So that created even more effects in terms of um, people's health. Also, um, another thing that um, showed up um, in, as we were talking to parents about the child tax credit was the intensification of racial discrimination and racial violence, right? So we know that throughout the pandemic, we saw a number of effects around the impact of, of differences, right, along racial lines in terms of what was happening. Um, but also we see, right, a number of forms of violence that have taken place over the last two years throughout the pandemic. Right, um, particularly in terms of the pandemic, right? In terms of the sort of racialized norms around who has um, the virus, who transmitted, who transmits it, where it comes from, and who's dying, 
right? So all of those things were coming up and those things also had a great impact on people's sense of self, but, but also their health and their well-being, as well as their ability to navigate different, different systems because of that impact. And as it relates to the child tax credit, um, we know that the, the story um, isn't in itself, right, just a one of sunshine around the tax credit, child tax credit. There were a number of barriers that prevented um, parents who, who qualify for the benefits from accessing it. And we know that those barriers were interlocking. We know that those, um, as um, Stephanie presented, right, we know that those barriers are around, right, that there's sort of different um, accesses of, of discrimination, right? We know them around race, around gender, around banking status, around um, migration status, around citizenship, right? But also there were a number of factors that came up in the in the pandemic that were new that added to these um, conditions of exclusion and marginalization. We know about the, the um, distribution of resources throughout the pandemic, right? The interaction with the IRS and all of those factors that made um, some parents um, fearful around accessing the credit even when they qualified for it and it was um, their right to access it. Similarly, for those parents who did access the child tax credit, we know that there was an abrupt end to these payments, um, unfortunately, and that did a number of things. It increased um, family economic hardship, um, it, it, inc it increased distrust, right, around benefits and the stability that might have been created in terms of protections around being able to afford basic needs, but also created great of skepticism given the current social political situation of parents. So the fact that parents were seeing that resources are being distributed in different ways for different political um, reasons, right, or for different issues around the world, but the these sort of basic measures just to secure that people weren't living in poverty and their conditions um, worsening throughout the pandemic were removed. Next slide, please. Thank you. And so finally, um, just to sort of wrap up the sort of nature of CTC access, what we do know is that CT access um, the child tax credit access was even more difficult among families that were marginalized on particular access. Um, access. So one that, that is um, particular that we like to highlight is thinking about um, immigrant families, right? And the struggles that they faced with qualifying for the tax credit, child tax credit, right? And we can talk more later about how information was circulating around the child tax credit and the fear that was created. But I will um, read through um, one of the parents' uh, reflections on how she could have uh, benefited if she didn't face barriers. So she said, having the child tax credit uh, would have made me feel calmer. They didn't say one shouldn't talk about debts and things like that, but it's a major reason I would feel relieved because, well, certainly you have to take out money for the debt. You have to take the money out for rent. Um, you have to take the money out for, well, food, gas, and it was sky high, all of it. So certainly the CCC would have helped me feel more relaxed, calmer. So yes, it helped. So in total, the um, child tax credit, while it did help alleviate some of the stress um, on families when it was available, its um, removal um, unexpectedly and without notice and without a phase out plan, in addition to some families not being able to access it, created um, even more insecurity and instability among families. Thank you. And we just want to take a moment too to thank all of our funders of this work, the Boston University Center for Anti-Racist Research, the Sir Schusterman Family Philanthropies, and also the Annie Casey Foundation. Thank you, Dr. Burnett and Dr. Edinger. Now we're going to hear from Shali Gupta Barnes and Allison Bogal Ammon about some of our policy implications moving forward. Yes, thank you. And thank you for joining us today. The findings of this study, it really can't be underscored how much they point to an urgent need for action. We know that early childhood and the families interviewed for this study all have young children. That is a critical window of growth and development. Babies and toddlers are literally growing the brains that they will have for the rest of their lives. And we know from decades of research that even brief periods of economic hardship and stress that have just been described 
really can have profound and lasting effects on a child's health and development. And we also know it can impact their parents' own physical and mental health. Well before the pandemic, families of young children were experiencing alarmingly high rates of poverty and economic hardship, higher than national averages across the population. And during the pandemic, as Drs. Burnett and Dr. Edinger de Cuba described, we heard from families as they struggled to afford rent, to put food on the table, to afford childcare and diapers and formula and a whole host of basic necessities for their children. And that placed an enormous stress on parents who were really striving to care for their children under these difficult circumstances. And so we must act now. We know that these uh, conditions are imperiling the health of our young children and their families and exacerbating health inequities that existed well before the pandemic. Our country's infants, toddlers, and preschoolers cannot continue to wait for political posturing and negotiations. We must act now and we must act swiftly. The Advanced Child Tax Credit, which was expanded under the American Rescue Plan very temporarily, provided swift, tangible relief for families struggling to afford basic expenses. This research is consistent with other studies that show that families use the monthly payments to pay for things like food, rent, child care, bills. A key component of this expansion and the policy change that was enacted under the American Rescue Plan was that it expanded the credit to include families with the lowest incomes, including families that had no earned income reported on their taxes. It granted them the full benefits of the CTC. This meant that the one third of children who were disproportionately children of color who were previously excluded from the full value of the credit because their families had incomes that were too low to qualify for the full CTC were eligible for these payments. The American Rescue Plan also made other important changes to the CTC, including temporarily boosting benefits and enabling payments to be paid out monthly, which helped smooth incomes and, as noted, helped families afford the things when they needed it. And so while the Inflation Reduction Act that was passed in the Senate this week certainly addresses some important issues around climate change and health care affordability, we are deeply disappointed that this bill missed a tremendous opportunity to expand the robust investment improvements to the child tax credit that were passed in the Build Back Better Act in the House last year. This research highlights the urgent need to expand the CTC to create an equitable and inclusive credit so that all children, regardless of their parents' employment status, regardless of immigration status, all children growing up here in the United States have access to critical benefits. And we urge Congress to expand the credit this year. We cannot continue to wait. It has to happen this year. But we can't stop there. As noted by this research, there were enormous barriers that families faced, and we have to make sure that the advanced child tax credit and all tax credits are equitably administered and reach all children eligible for it. The parents we surveyed, as has been highlighted, talked extensively about the barriers they faced in accessing the credit. Many parents were made aware of the credit through various outreach campaigns, but still troubled, struggled to gain access to those payments when they needed them due to challenges filing taxes, taxes or accessing support. We heard time and time again about how designing a system that is easier to navigate, that instills trust for families is critical. And so we're glad that the Senate included funding for IRS taxpayer services and other components of the Inflation Reduction Act. And we urge IRS and Treasury to engage, com engage communities most impacted by discrimination and access barriers to deploy resources effective at improving these systems. And so in addition to the changes to the CTC, as is noted, families are experiencing a wide range of challenges. And they talked about the ways in which um, ability to afford basic needs affects their mental and physical health and well-being. So now I'll hand it over to Shelly Gupta Barnes, policy director at the Cairo Center, to discuss further how the pandemic has affected families with low incomes and the policy solutions that we really need to respond to these inequities. Thank you so much, Allison, um, and everyone who worked on this report. Um, before I go into these policy recommendations, uh, it's important to remember that before the pandemic, 140 million people 
We're poor or one emergency away from economic ruin. And as the economy shut down in the pandemic and millions of people were out of work, backed up on rent and utilities and other bills, we saw policies that were targeted to meet these needs that were enacted and that were highly effective. The expanded child tax credit was one such policy. And as we heard from our research team, these monthly payments of just a few hundred dollars over a period of six months significantly improved household ability to catch up on rent. Um, it improved their physical health. It helped them to be able to afford childcare, food, and even reduce uh, mental and emotional stress and depression. What this tells us is that poverty and economic insecurity are not intractable, inevitable, or even individual problems to solve. Rather, policies like the expanded child tax credit can lift the load of poverty, lift the load of poverty. And the impacts of that are immediate, they're tangible, and they're life-giving. By broadening eligibility and giving households a sense of consistency over time, without imposing restrictive means testing, without the indignities of morals testing to access these benefits, the expanded CTC changed the daily lives of millions of people. And as the title report says, one recipient described this by saying, I didn't have to worry. That is until the payment stopped. And alongside the gaps and inequities that we heard about, the other side of this story is that those gains that were made were very tenuous. In a matter of weeks, millions of children fell below the poverty line. On its own, in other words, the expanded CTC is not enough to fundamentally address these longstanding inequities and this widespread poverty. Therefore, we have to understand it as just one piece of a broader, more inclusive, and more expansive social welfare system that we needed before the pandemic, that we needed during the pandemic, and that we still need today. In fact, I mean, I would say that we have to consider the pandemic era uh, expansion of the CTC as a new floor for the kinds of policies we need going forward, including, as we highlight in the report, making sure everyone who is eligible for this expanded CTC can access it with culturally appropriate outreach and enrollment efforts, a simplified tax filing platform available in multiple languages, and making sure government agencies like the IRS can, can in fact make it accessible. We need to have universal rights and access to housing, food, and healthcare, including mental health care. This includes regulatory measures to prevent corporations and other highly profitable entities from grossly profiting off of our basic needs in a, in the, uh, in a crisis, but even any time. We have to reverse discriminatory policies that explicitly or implicitly exclude families from critical social welfare benefits. And finally, we recommend implementing automatic stabilizers across policies to ensure that income supports are ready and able to be rapidly issued in economic downturns or other crises we may face as a nation. While this isn't in our report, the, the past few weeks has also revealed to us the necessity of ensuring a robust and broadly inclusive democracy where we have the ability to participate, to meaningfully participate in the decisions that impact our lives, whether that's with the child tax credit, a minimum wage or autonomy over our own bodies. We need to ensure that our government at every level, uh, at every level is held accountable to we the people. We know what we need to do, we know what we need, so no matter how long it takes, it's on all of us to make this possible. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Shali. Um, I'm not seeing any questions right now in the chat. And so we're gonna go ahead and wrap up, assuming it's the same for all of you. We appreciate your time today. Again, if you've enjoyed this conversation, feel free to keep the conversation going this evening at 6 p.m. Eastern for lessons from the pandemic, the impact of the child tax credit. Also, the full report will be available on the Children's Health Watch site within the Kairos Center website as well. Thank you all for your time.